Great, beautiful. Thank you very much. All right, guys. Hello, everyone. Hola. Oh, good. All right. Uh, this is a Samsung IoT Cloud Strategy. I'm happy to have a wonderful panelist. Uh, you guys probably could recognize two faces here who are just on the stage announcing keynotes. So this will be by far the best sessions ever. So without actually further ado, let me introduce our wonderful panelists. Number one, Yun Lee, who's right next to me. He is the uh, head of uh, contents and services in US and the one who actually introduced Family Hub today. He is actually being called AKA as a, the Nagger. Nagger. All right. The nagger. <laughs> All right. And the next, we have a uh, VP, Jaejun Lee. He is currently the VP of Samsung Mobile in head office. He actually does two things. Number one is a cloud platform, and second, service PM. I don't know how he finds his time. But he is known as the decision maker. All right. And then the next, <laughs> next to him, we have uh, Luke Julia. He is the VP of Innovations in our Arctic SSIC divisions, and he is known as, guess what? A refrigerator? <laughs> the thinker. All right, and finally, we have Robert Parker, CTO of SmartThings, who introduced the SmartThings strategy today on the stage, and he is known as a passerby. <laughs> All right. Anyway. OK, so we have a great, great sessions. We're going to really go in depth about the smart things and what it's about from the developer aspect and partners aspect and the, from consumers aspect, chips and modules and then refrigerators and whatnot. So we're going to have a wonderful session. This session is going to be actually hour and half. And when, before we discuss, we were like, how are we going to actually have a discussion for an hour and a half? People will leave. So, Feel free to leave, right? We're going to continue to talk. But we're going to actually turn this over to your questions so that you will have a time to ask the panelists during the, uh, during the sessions. But before we actually go to the next uh, step, oh, here's wonderful pictures. We're going to actually watch one video that actually shows what is the power of smart things, the new solutions, the United States. Did you know that smart things can monitor, control, and automate your home? to make life a little bit easier? When you wake up in the morning, smart things can turn on lights, turn up the thermostat, turn on the radio, and turn on the coffee machine. When you're ready to leave home, smart things can lock all the doors, turn off all the lights and appliances, turn down the thermostat, and turn on the security camera. While you're away from home, smart things can send you video alerts if there's unexpected activity or warn you if there's a water leak. When you arrive home in the evening, smart things can adjust the color of your lights, turn on your favorite music, and control your appliances. And when you're ready to go to sleep, smart things can warn you if doors or windows have been left open. Before then, turning off all the lights and turning down the thermostat. And remember, smart things works with a wide range of connected devices, including lights, speakers, locks, thermostats, sensors, and more. So you can build the smart home of your dreams. Samsung Smart Things. Add a little smartness to your things. Beautiful. I, I like that. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Add a little smartness to your thing. I, I love that tagline. But before we actually go to the questions, let me ask one question that I have to really see. There's no Samsung in this new brand of smart things. So children, is this intentional or is this just a mistake? I mean, why there's no Samsung in front of smart things, the new unified IoT strategy of Samsung? OK, so before I answer that, let me just, um, I mean, I'm really excited to be here. Yesterday, I had a nightmare. Um, the session was empty. <laughs> and so I woke up, and today I'm having a different nightmare here. <laughs> but, I'm really excited to be here, surrounded by the two of the keynote speakers. Did you guys like the keynote today? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Smart things all over the place. So, so <laughs> just, just, to, just to say a little bit about the brand, yes, it's intentional. So we really work towards combining all of our technologies that within Samsung Electronics into a one single cloud. Uh, and, and we really 
thought about like what's behind that. I mean, in, in addition to the unification of everything that we do, uh, I, I think that our, our one of the major theme that we wanted to bring about is the openness, um, inviting. That, you know, with Samsung as a great name, I mean, I really love working for Samsung. Great company, great brand. As DJ said it, number six in the most admired brand within. Well, only number six. Oh, only number six for today. <laughs> but uh, it's keep climbing up. So, but, you know, we want to make sure that the openness comes across. And then that's why we made a decision along with uh, working with our marketing team to come up with this, uh, the, the brand that we can attach to this uh, single cloud. And then that, that decision was to go with the smart things and dropping the name of Samsung. So really excited about that. Yeah. That's, that's, um, that's really good to hear that Samsung really deciding that the name doesn't really have to be associated with open IoT cloud. Robert, let me ask you a question. I mean, you represent a company called Smart Things. Now it's part of the Samsung, but seeing that company name being used as really future strategy of our IoT, I mean, what does it mean to you? So, um, like Jay, thank you for joining us today um, and really ushering in the next stage of smart things. So from day one, we've always been really interested in building this for the partners, for the rest of the ecosystem. So that was where we've always liked having a neutral position because we always believe that at the end of the day, all the customers, they're never going to use things from a single platform or from a single vendor. And so for smart things, the natural evolution of that, though, is really being part of a very large ecosystem. And so it's really exciting to be able to bring in 30 million Samsung devices that are part of this and can bring power to all the experiences that all the developers and partners create. So from a smart things perspective, it's exciting when every new partner comes in. Every new partner brings their devices. and. Uh, we can work together to sort of make our devices smarter. And so today is a really exciting day for us because uh, we have fused together a really large number of devices into what is now the largest ecosystem in the world uh, for IoT. And so that really is an exciting culmination of a direction that Samsung started this journey two years ago. And Smart Things has been trying to do this for four years, even previous to the acquisition. And it's really amazing to see it all come together now. Great. I mean, you talked about openness and why it was intentional for Samsung to drop the name of Samsung and use the smart things as one brand. But look, I mean, for Arctic, I mean, you guys had your own name, right? I mean, we saw the great message of Arctic and Samsung Connect and smart things is really coming as one brand. But I mean, for you, I mean, what does it mean to you? I mean, you know, you guys announced Arctic Cloud last year and now decide to be part of the smart thing. So what does it mean to you? And what does it mean to the existing partners who already are using Arctic Cloud? So same thing, I'm very happy to be here. Everybody's like saying <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Did uh, you turn it on? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it is on. Okay. It is on. Right, so. It's green. So. <laughs> Um, so what does it mean for, uh, for us and for the partners? Uh, in the short term, it means nothing. So uh, it means basically that everything is going to stay the same. Um, we are going to work uh, um, towards a transition in the next few months altogether. And we are going to be sure that the partners that we have today uh, are going to um, have all the features in the cloud to be, in this new, uh, in this new smart things cloud. Um, so we started this uh, journey on our side uh, about five years ago, and uh, we were all about also interoperability and, uh, and openness. So we are very excited you know, to, to be able to join all the forces in, inside Samsung. Samsung is a very, very complex company you know, with a lot of silos, a lot of people that are kind of doing the same thing. The, what we succeeded to do uh, with, this, uh, with this panel here, with those people here, uh, is to uh, bring together all the forces inside Samsung in order to create, as uh, Robert just said, something huge and something that is going to help people to uh, connect all their devices of their life you know, uh, inside, uh, in, uh, into the, this platform. So it's going to be very, very exciting. Great. So just to be able to round up, so, so Yun Lee, 
I mean, you introduce uh, Family Hub, and I want to make sure that uh, I get it correctly. It's the center of our home, right? Of, of course. Yeah, of course. You're right. It's the center of our home. It's not the living room. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what does it mean the refrigerator is being part of one IoT ecosystem? Sure. Hey, before that, uh, I'm not planning on spending here for 90 minutes, just so you know, <laughs> unless you guys have questions. Okay? So um, I think Thomas had a great idea to make this a very avant-garde panel, panel session for making it long, because every time I go to a panel s session, you know, we wanted to ask questions, but it was always too short, right? <laughs> so we'll, we'll be short, but you guys keep it long, please, okay? Otherwise, we're going to all leave. <laughs> um, I think uh, there's a number of reasons why uh, we were thinking from multiple angles, right? And I think um, a lot of the answers, uh, the answers to the question that you were asking were addressed in today's um, keynote speech. But when we work with like, particularly like mobile phones, right? And then when we think about our own behavior, Something as much, do you know this term called delayed decision? Which is a very, it, it, delayed decision was actually coined by Iacocca um, when he was trying to turn his company around, uh, Chrysler. So what delayed decision means is that you actually delay the decision until you can finally lock everything so that you make a lot of changes, delay the decision towards the end, and then when you, when you lock the decision, you run like hell. So that was kind of the term that he coined. Did you notice that you're actually doing a lot of delayed decisions these days? Like, for example, when I'm making an appointment, say with you, right? Maybe like 10 years ago, I would say like, hey, Thomas, let's meet tomorrow. And then you'll ask, what time, where? Give me all the logistics so I can put it in. Instead, these days we say, okay, that's it, right? And then one hour before, I, I would send you a text and say, where are we meeting, right? <laughs> and then you'll say, I don't know. But I'm not, I'm not panicked, right? Why, why is that? It's because, it's because we're connected, right? It's because I ha I'm so, my mind is so secure because I know I'm connected to him. If you look at your home, interestingly enough, that's the last resort that's really not connected to your life. So how many of you know whether right now your bedroom window is open or closed? Right? Not, not many, right? Not many, see? How many, how many you can be assured that your gas line is not leaking? Right? So if you look at the most important space, home, and it's the last resort that's not connected. So we needed a platform to make your home connected to your lifestyle. I, mean, I think that's the real driver. Mm. So uh, to my earlier um, keynote speech, we really looked for that Trojan horse or whatever you want to call it, that, that platform that can host this. And it was just so obvious, 24-7 on, you go devastated if the refrigerator, refrigerator goes dead, right? And you'd probably go devastated if you're disconnected at some part of your day, whether, even if you're sleeping, right? Mm -hmm. So those two are parad par paradigm-wise, they, 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 they two are matching very well together. So that kind of propagated into, and then I'll talk about some of the challenges we have later on, but that kind of propagated into the, uh, to the idea of, okay, let's turn. It wasn't really like, okay, <laughs> how can we sell our panels more? No, it wasn't, it wasn't really like that. It was more like, we need to turn the house, mm. the home, mm. connected to your, your connected lifestyle. So that, that, that was the motivation. Uh, oh, cool. Well, now let's take that um, conversation of smart things into more technical components. I, I know that smart things is consisted of number one, one cloud, one applications, and really down to the chip level, right? So let's take a moment to talk, discuss cloud, right? Now, this particular cloud, when it comes to connectivity and compatibility, right? I and mean, there's probably many things that we have to discuss. But um, Robert, I mean, the existing cloud that you have already has an ecosystem. How big is it and how fast it is growing? And how do we actually bring this under the umbrella of smart things cloud? Um, great question. I think that one of the things that people always want to know when they attach themselves to an ecosystem is, what's the momentum? How, how fast is it changing? Um, 
from two years ago to last year, uh, we tripled the number of users. From last year to this year, we quadrupled the number of users. And those are just new people coming into the system. The other thing that's happened is uh, with devices on the system, your average user has gone from uh, within three months or 90 days tends to go from five to 11 devices. So the type of growth that I'm talking about on the device side is 10x <laughs> what I just said that was happening um, on the user side. So there's been a heavy amount of adoption. We've seen that actually really start to accelerate partially because of voice. So that's unlocking, that's making it easier for people to get started. Uh, there's a variety of voice agents that people can choose. But one of the things that we've found now is that going from two years ago when basically no one used voice in IoT or maybe 1%, 51% of people in IoT now use a voice agent in some capacity. Uh, they may not use it for automation. It may be used instead to play a song. But because of that, what we're seeing is that the ecosystem is just growing really, really, really quickly. People are starting to adopt this. And that's really exciting for everyone. Um, one of the things that it th has changed as a result is that now partners are really starting to work together more different, differently than they have in the past. Because it wasn't just about bringing your product. But a lot of the value that you would get, and this is something that's been somewhat true forever. Because if you have a motion detector and a light, the real magic is when you walk into a room, the light turns on. That was more exciting than either of the individual devices. That is actually starting to be realized now because there's enough devices. It doesn't work very well if it's two or three. But it works, starts to work really well when it's eight or 10. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really sort of flipped it. So that's been a really exciting change to see us go from three years ago, hundreds of thousands of people in consumer homes were, were doing IoT. Right now in the US, we're slightly over 20 million uh, that do things we would properly call IoT, and maybe upwards of 40 million that have devices that could be considered connected. Wow, that's a huge number. Now let's talk about the, then uh, we're going to actually have a single API to the SmartThings Cloud that are encompassing all the Samsung Connect and SmartThings and RT Cloud all combined. The developers will have a one single API to be able to interface. Is that correct? That's correct. So one of the biggest challenges for developers is, uh, you know, one of the things was how to easily build your solution. And one of the things that makes it hard is you'll do three flavors of that. Uh, many of you have done things for voice agents today and re-implement it, or for mobile clients, you'll do at least two and often several more implementations. So one of the things that we've been really focused on is making sure that you only have to do the work once and it keeps working, which is the other challenge um, in IoT is as everyone else has a cloud, as all these different developers are doing things in different ways, it may have worked when you initially launched your product but to keep it working uh, is a challenge. And so one of the things that helps that is to have a single API because it makes it a lot easier for all the systems to be able to keep working over time. Okay. I heard that the, as of this morning, new website called developer.samsung.com is officially open with a smart things. And there all the API is publicly open for all the developers to start accessing through it. Is that, is that right? That's, that's right. That's what I heard. Which, I mean, great work for you guys. Look, all the Arctic clouds and all the APIs that you guys used to have has been all consolidated under one umbrella? It will be. It will be. OK, it's not there yet. Not there yet. It's going to take a few months to, to complete the, the full integration. But uh, every single API that, uh, that we have, or the one that are conflicting, will be resolved. But uh, everything that our current customers can do um, on, the, on the cloud, on our cloud, they will be able also to do it on the, on the new cloud. Great, great. That's so good. I just want to add one thing. So I think, as Thomas said, the uh, uh, SmartThings developers portal will be open today. You will be able to see it as uh, one of the demo or developers uh, kiosk. Um, so I hope, I hope you guys all go out and check it out. Uh, there will be uh, additional tools, um, developer workspace and others, which will help you as a developer to be able to download and then use the local SDKs and then be, have an IDE that you, know, you can use to create the device, um, make a connection to the cloud. Um, those will be shortly becoming available, but you'll be able to get a taste and then the functionality of today, uh, but uh, it, it will be coming shortly. Okay. So, so as, as uh, Luke said it, 
the Arctic integration is being planned. Um, so I've been working for Samsung Mobile for about a little over five years. And I think one thing I learned working at five years was how to shorten the delivery of the things. So <laughs> he, he said few months. So it'll be really few months that you know, we're going to make it available <laughs> so that you guys can get the Arctic uh, things and APIs available in the single cloud, single ecosystem very, very soon. Great, great. Uh, you know, when it comes to cloud, I think that two more things is very important. Number one is coding language, right? So I know that the, um, you know, standardization in IoT world is important. So Robert, it's going back to you. I know that you guys been actually uh, the, the one who's standing up for OCF center. We we'll usually give this to Robert. <laughs> yeah, and then, <laughs> thank you, I'll give it to him. Uh, but OCF going forward, is it? It's going to be changed, or is this continuing to be the theme of our programming standardizations? So, there's a couple parts to the question that you asked, which is why I had to pause. <laughs> <laughs> you almost stuffed everything possible into one question. Uh, but one of the things that we want to say, and we may not have explicitly said about our platform so far, is you do have choice of any programming language. So it's one of the exciting things that we are launching today, is that we have a, what we call an untrusted execution model. And so what it allows you to do is you can run your solution on your laptop, wherever you want. You could build it on tools that you might be familiar with, like Node. You could use Go. You can use any program, Python. You can use programming language of choice. And that's one of the things that we think allows you to just get your solution done so much faster. Because if someone's built a library with a particular set of tools, you can integrate that set of tools and get going. You don't have to say, well, I need to rebuild that into my Groovy sandbox and you know, move it all over, which many of the other systems in, um, in IoT have, have this characteristic. So we, we sort of try to unleash that potential. At the same time, when you're a developer, there are different types of things that you're trying to do. Uh, and so you may have a device that's very unique, um, like a robot vacuum cleaner that has many bits of functionality. It's not like a light where there are 17 different lights, but they mostly do the same thing. Uh, and in that case, what we've tried to do is make use of, through SmartThings OCF, a, a standards-based model for communicating all the bespoke characteristics of that. Um, in addition to that, we have a more open model for something that we call a capability, where you as the community can suggest others. We start with about 80, which covers lights, locks, thermostats, but most of the common capabilities that you might see. Um, you can have something like a refrigerator, and it can have three cameras that sh sort of have those standard capabilities, and you can do all the same things with the cameras in your fridge as you could with other cameras. So our spectrum of APIs covers both of those cases. It allows you to, at the bespoke level, in a standard way, communicate everything that's special about your device while at the same time allowing people to easily control the things that uh, are the same. One of the other sessions does this to sort of you know, have a car where it has lock, it has a light. Those things just hook up automatically because those capabilities can be understood. There will be other things in the car which, um, like the odometer or something else that's specific, you know, OCF really helps us be able to expose that in a way that people can consume it in a standards-based way. And it really bridges this gap between something that's really unique um, and in the past might have been done in a way that's non-standard as a result and then really hard to build on. Uh, and then at the same time, really letting you capture and build upon capabilities that are common. So we have a, a spectrum of solutions, but OCF uh, really helps us with capturing that uniqueness and giving you some standard ways to deal with it. OK, so you're really um, taking OCF as a continuing strategy for Samsung, smart, I mean, not Samsung, but smart things, solutions going forward, right? And asking all the developers to really use and adopt OCF as a sender. We at Samsung have uh, all of our devices communicating through a standard protocol. And we think mm -hmm. that uh, using a standard-based mechanism for communication lets partners build on that that mm -hmm. much more easily. We encourage others to do that. Uh, the broader cloud lets you do whatever you want, and so that's one of the exciting things. But for many people, you want to get started in a standards-based way. Uh, SmartThings OCF is a great way to bring your devices in and immediately participate. Okay, great. Now, let's take a moment to actually go into the second important components of SmartThings, which is applications, right? 
I know that Samsung already has application for Samsung Connect. There are different applications on different devices. So, Jejun, I know that you are kind of trying to actually get all those applications on the client side all becoming one. Are we there yet? I mean, what, what is our strategy? Oh, yes, we, we are. Um, so, the, the currently the Samsung Connect app is deployed, and I think we have uh, about, uh, one second, I have the number 20, uh, 11 million registered users uh, using the Samsung Connect app. Wow. Um, so, I mean, as, as Robert said, it, there is, this is the biggest ecosystem that we, ha we, are, we are aware of, uh, the, of the thing. Going forward, uh, with the SmartThings name adoption, um, we will be changing our cloud name to be SmartThings. Our application will be renamed to be SmartThings application. So, so, but the same application um, will be available in not just in the mobile side, which is primarily where the engagement is happening, but we will be working with the um, SPP Unilis uh, team in the DA and with the VD uh, from the TV side, we'll be adapting same application to provide what we all called it in the keynote speech, a seamless and consistent user experience. So the people will be able to, they don't have to remember how does it work. It works the same way on TV, it works the same way on the mobile, and then same Bixby will be made available in the future so that the voice interface will be identical across all devices. So yes, the, the application itself is ready. Uh, we will be expanding with the rollout of the new TVs and new refrigerators, uh, the same application. Wow, so we're gonna actually... I can even use it on my watch, is that true? Oh, that's right, so there is a Samsung Connect application is also available on the phone uh, with the same touch of the Bixby. On, on the, on the gear, on the okay. gear wearables, right? So that, that, that's a great news. So not only the cloud is one, but even client applications that gets loaded on different devices will be actually merged into one seamless application. It's gonna be called as a SmartThings app? Yes. So Yun, I mean, what does it mean to you? So Family Hub already creating some kind of use cases that are important, but having this IoT, the same application that is on the mobile phone called SmartThings, mm -hmm. It's being loaded on the family hub. What does it mean as a possibility of expanding to the new features? I, I, I mean, for, for one thing, it's clearly sim, you know, seamless UI, right? Mm -hmm. Seamless experiences. So that's a, that's a very obvious thing. But um, one of the things that we're really trying to unlock across multiple devices, just not, not only family hub, but most all, you know, for example, home appliances device is, we're trying to focus on developing sensors that make mm -hmm. sense so that the developers could actually utilize that and create something more meaningful. So I'll give you a few examples. And, and one example, again, is from the keynote, but we do have camera built in um, to the refrigerator. Refrigerator, right? right? Inside, right? Right, and then it, it will eventually have all the same uh, benefits of using one cloud system. So. You can literally do lots of different things uh, using that. And that's, a, that's a sensor. Um, I can't promise you what we're putting in, into you know, additional sensors into the refrigerators, but potentially it could be like smell sensors. It could be all kinds of different sensors. So you can smell the uh, rotten milk exactly. in the fridge. Yeah. Wow. So, so for example, like, and, and an, another solution that we're trying to solve, but we need partners' help, is, for example, like, um, uh, or, Freezer is really no man's land. Freezer <laughs> is basically like when we do some consumer research, no one exactly knows what's in their freezer. <laughs> it's, it's no man's land, right? But it, it's, it's looking for a solution, right? right? So we're really eager to hear partners' approach to making the solution. And because now they're utilizing one cloud, one, you know, one te uh, technical input and output, mm -hmm. It becomes much easier, and you can expand that um, use case to you know mobile phone, TVs, and 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 uh, and, 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 and gear watch and all that kind of stuff. So I, I want to add just one more thing because I think you know Samsung Electronics has a great sets of this uh, um, the devices with sensors and capabilities, but it worked as a multiple different companies per se. Let's say, right? The, Are you sure you want to reveal that truth? That that's the that's the. <laughs> Total honest opinion, you know, that I felt. There is, there is a mobile division. There is a great TV division. There is a digital appliance division. There is a semiconductor division. But we all have our own PNLs, and we work like that. But I think, as as DJ highlighted in the keynote, 
it's that one Samsung, okay. unity, consolidation is, is the really message that I, we, are, we are trying to put together. So in addition to the one cloud, one client, I mean, I think the message is going out like this. There was, there is like a calendar application on TV, calendar application on the refrigerator, but their icons look different than from the mobile. So even though you are the Samsung user of mobile TV, but finding a calendar application or contact application across devices used to be a different experience. So we are, we are, we are, we are, we are all consolidating that even to that level of experience where the application itself will be consistent, but the way of interacting, the icons, the layout, we're going to be working, to, we're working really hard to make that consistent across all devices. So that's our, that's our, that's our uh, path forward. So, so when is that uh, new SmartThings app available to the public? So, so it's available on the mobile, okay. right? Um, and, and then, uh, so, so under the name of Samsung Connect, mm -hmm. the rebranding, we are targeting early next year. So, so we'll, we'll come back to you at the specific schedule. Uh, but um, yes, that is, it's happening. Can developers develop against the new SmartThings application via SDK now? So the SDKs will be available not for the client, but it will be available to the cloud. Okay. And then the SDKs will be working against those uh, activities and then devices register the cloud. Yeah, so, so that's what will be available. Great. I saw the smart things, the new solutions package that Samsung has created. I find the uniqueness in the, system, the chip. I mean, what you guys saw on the, on, the, on the stage is not only just cloud, not only just applications, very software. But we are getting down to the hardware chip module and making those chips available as IoT, right? I mean, that was a great message. So look, my question is to you, is that what does this, um, you know, the, the brand new Arctic system of modules, how does it work with us, the new SmartThings cloud and what it means is to the developers? So the, first of all, we need to, to understand what uh, is the Arctic program. The Arctic program is end-to-end -end program, end-to-end -end meaning uh, from the chip, from the system on module, to the cloud. And the idea uh, was and is that if we create uh, chips that are going to very easily connect to the cloud and uh, very easily onboard to the cloud, it's going to allow those devices to uh, just be seamless for the, for the users. Mm -hmm. So a user that is going to have an Arctic chip in the device uh, is going to just you know when he turns on the device, the device somehow magically is going to connect to the cloud. Magically, really? Magically, so the, the idea is the magic. I mean, we wanted okay. really to create magic there. And, uh, and so the full program was designed to uh, be sure that every single device is going to connect to the Arctic cloud at the time. Now that we are merging Arctic cloud with a SmartThings cloud, this magic is going still to happen uh, with the uh, Arctic devices. Mm -hmm. so every single device, every single de um, piece of hardware that is going to have uh, the um, Arctic system on module inside, uh, they are going to connect automatically to the new SmartSync cloud. So this magic that we are you know, aiming and that we are working on for the past few years, I mean, is going to be available in the next few months for, uh, for everybody who wants to create devices. Mm. Just a curiosity, the project ambience that we saw on the stage today, is there an Arctic chip in those things? Correct, yes. So they, they are using uh, Arctic 5, I believe. I'm not mm -hmm. sure exactly which one they are using inside. 5. 5, yes. <laughs> so uh, so uh, the, 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 this is definitely something showing the magic. I mean, you also on stage, you know how beautiful it is. And, uh, and that's, that's part of the... Uh, I mean, the Arctic chips are very powerful, powerful chips, right? I mean, I'm not a hardware specialist, so I mean, I'm not going to tell you much more about that. But I mean, what I know is that they do connect. Um, I mean, whatever connectivity you decide to use and that we are supporting, they are going to connect at the end to this cloud. And they are going to take the full advantage of the services that are going to be available on the cloud from the other devices that are uh, in this uh, ecosystem. That's, that's a beautiful story. So you have a chip within smart things that are magically connecting to SmartThings Cloud when you actually build it. You have an application, single application that really connects all the devices and create a seamless experience. And you have a one cloud that does it all. So this is a whole entire package to do all the IoT stuff. That's great news. Also security. I mean, we heard from James today that 
the beauty of all underneath, there's a security which is a concern for a lot of different people. It's still empowering some of this connectivity to be, uh, to be secure. So what does it mean? Can you really break it down to a little bit more detail? What does it mean from Arctic chip having a security? And what does it mean, Jejun or Robert, to you guys, to the cloud or an application? Yeah, I'll start with the Arctic side. So, I mean, when we designed the, the Arctic chips, uh, it was uh, with security in mind. Because we know that one of the big challenges in, the, in IoT in the next few years uh, is going to be, you know, uh, not to be hacked, right? I'm not going to say here that we are not going to be hacked, but we are doing everything in order not to be hacked. Uh, and um, the way the program was designed is really to have security embedded in the chip. Mm. So uh, we, we have um, what is called a secure element inside that is going to communicate with the cloud in order to have a secure connection from the very deep root of the chip into the cloud. Mm. So we are going to be able to know that every communication that is going to go back and forth is going to be legitimate. So that, that was the way the program was designed. So security in mind as a very, very first uh, priority. Now, about the, the, the rest, I can let those guys you know, talk about it. But of course, I mean, this security that we had in the uh, Arctic uh, cloud, we are going to spread it you know, inside the SmartSync cloud. Because we need to be sure that those devices are going to take advantage of this deeply rooted security. We, we have uh, really two problems that we've tried to address for the ecosystem. So one of them is to be very fine-grained. Um, because we expect that there may be a problem eventually. And so an example of this is if you have an energy solution that's looking at the battery life of several devices, that's really only able to see the battery life of those devices. They couldn't, that couldn't see whether your lock is locked or unlocked, even if it's able to see whether the battery life of that device is low. And we achieved this through a very high level of isolation between both the devices, the messages, the commands, and being fine-grained about levels of permission in that. And we think that that's the backbone of a lot of security because at the end of the day, we are expecting some of those devices, since we can't control every aspect of them, um, they may become compromised. And so, you know, having an isolation layer allows us to mitigate that compromise, manage it. Uh, we have some really exciting capabilities in the cloud to do anomaly detection on this. And so one of the things is that um, in a typical case of some kind of an exploit or an outbreak, there's somebody who finds out about it first. And we can learn and, and react to that. And so some of those are the key components of the security system beyond saying, hey, I have a really secure way for me to transmit messages from A to B. Um, we think of security much more holistically, and so it includes a lot of those elements that allows you to say, I'm really confident about having this device participate because just because it's been invited to participate doesn't mean that it compromises the whole security of my system. Mm. So just uh, one question on the security. By the way, we have a separate security sessions on the IoT. Uh, with a, actually great panelists, actually one of our VP, Jayan Chung, is uh, actually leading that particular panel. We have uh, different um, uh, uh, experts on the security coming to that discuss. But just one thing to, for just a simple layman's term, so does this mean that if you use a smart thing security, number one, can it be hacked? And number two, if it get hacked, then what happens to some of the capability it already has? Who wants to take it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so, I, so I, I mean, so let me let me get a crack at that. So, I mean, I think we, as as Robert and Luke said, you know, we take the security very, very seriously. So, now, as as Yoon mentioned in his speech, that I mean, can you guys imagine you doing part of your life today um, without being connected? I mean, I don't think we can imagine it, right? So, now that all these things are connected, it has to be. Um, securely uh, secure, right? If, if it's not connected, who cares? Only the robber uh, thief that comes into your house physically can do something to that. But with the connectivity, all these things are, you know, but the vulnerabilities and all these are open, right? So, so that's why I think when we, hello, when we when we build, you know, the the Arctic merge with us. Arctic had a, a very strong 
um, security, uh, like a chip uh, from the chip level model, uh, and then from our um, uh, like uh, my, my involvement uh, with Samsung for the last five years, one of the things that you know, we, we, we invested was the, it's a secure platform on Android side, the Knox, and we are, we are spreading that into our IoT ecosystem. So, so we, are, we are taking our uh, approach um, very, very seriously. Would there be a hack? Yes, there will be a hack attack, right? Now that we are announcing these as a one, there will be a more attempt, right? So, but what we are doing here is that we are providing the security guidelines, we are providing security the implementation you know, guidelines, and then the ways of dealing with when the new vulnerabilities come, because the security is always you are, you are, you are, um, you are secure to the level that you know today, right? and you keep improving on it. Right, so that we have the mechanism to build, uh, to mitigate uh, when the new issues arise. So that's what we have. On my end, uh, because I'm more on the receiving end and these guys are more on the solution end, one of the questions that I'd like to give it, throw out to you guys is, let's say that you walk into an Airbnb house and you saw a family hub with camera looking right at you. How would you feel? <laughs> right? What if, if there is a solution that you can disable that with a confirmation, mm -hmm. right? So there is a security at the technical level, but there's also security at the consumer level. Mm. So I think one of the interesting and very important thing that we need to do is to give you that peace of mind that I am in a secure environment. Mm -hmm. I thought the family help camera was looking inside, not outside. I, I mean, I said, what if? <laughs> what if? <laughs> Because so you're safe unless you go inside the refrigerator. Yeah. Because like we, we really had we had a we had a hard fought debate internally whether to put a camera also externally as well. Because one of the use cases was like people really loved taking their kids' photo right in front of the refrigerator so that it goes like into your, your screen, right? That's a legitimately good use case, but then oh, you know, S H I T camera. You know, and, and we kind of had some issues with camera on TV a long time back, so it's a real debate. So on the receiving end, we, we, we approach problem more from a consumer kind of approach. I, th I, th I think, and, and I believe this will happen, yeah. when, we, when we say security, you should feel secured, mm -hmm. not you should be told that you are secure. Yeah, I'd like to rebound of what Yun is saying. I mean, uh, for sure, in the, in the past five years, I mean, with the Arctic uh, uh, program, besides security, uh, the second big, huge piece of, uh, of philosophy that we have adopted is uh, more than security, I would call that privacy. Uh, because it's basically privacy for the users. We give to the users the keys. So we give them all the possibilities to control fully their experience. So for instance, in the case of the Airbnb, the potential case of Airbnb that you are talking about, we are going to be sure that the, the guest that is going to walk in this, uh, this environment is going to have all the tools in order to control if he wants or not to have this camera on. Okay? So privacy is also the second leg, mm -hmm. basically, of, of IoT and the success of IoT. If we don't solve security and privacy, we won't have IoT. Okay, so without taking too much time or attention from the security session that we are gonna have, please come to that for more uh, exploratory uh, discussions on the security and IoT, I mean security and privacy in that. Let's take a step back and look, let's take a look at what we have discussed here. Uh, so smart things have uh, three components. One is cloud, second is application, third one is a chip. Now when it comes to this particular solution, Seems like it's a close ecosystem that Samsung can do everything, right? So what happens to the other clouds that other companies are making, such as the one from Cupertino and from Amazon? I mean, it's a smart things cloud. I mean, what you guys doing? Is this going to be able to connect to other clouds seamlessly and provide the same connectivity throughout? Oh, what is the plan, Robert? So we are, as most people in this space are doing, um, we provide several mechanisms for the clouds to talk to each other. And um, they already do that. There are challenges. One of the things is, I alluded to this in the keynote this morning, you can have a, something like arming your home 
where that's been the big challenge for all the clouds. It's been very difficult for them to do a leader election and say, I have ADT, so that is the canonical thing that can decide whether my home is armed or not armed. And all of the other devices really have to coordinate with that. And so this is the next generation of sort of cloud integration that we're leading with all of the vendors. Um, and there are many aspects to this. So we might work with a company like Amazon on making it simpler for the utterances that you're speaking by having them having a deeper understanding of how you've named your rooms, um, having a deep understanding of which devices you might allow them to see. And you know, again, taking what Luke said, one of the things that we do is we try to put the user in the center of those discussions so that you can say, this is what I want to expose to that device. Um, but as we bring this together, we have taken an approach of sort of limitless connection. Um, we can, uh, as we work with these other clouds, we don't put preset limits on what that integration would look like, what you can do. We encourage it. We really want, from a customer perspective, that you're able to build on these solutions and they, they work together. And so our main focus has been just to take it from sort of dumb integrations that we are at now and, and make those smarter. And I'll give you one really concrete example as we worked with Nest, which is a learning thermostat. Sometimes as it's learning, your house starts to do the Amityville horror because it's trying to figure out whether you're away or you're home. And then your light rules, which Nest is not aware of, <laughs> start triggering. Next thing you know, your neighbor phones you up and says, you know, that on that unexpected business trip that you went on, Robert, your house lights were flashing on and off. And they realized, oh, it's because my thermostat was testing a hypothesis that I might be away <laughs> unexpectedly and, and try to react to that. And that's where you have these two sort of smart pieces um, of the ecosystem working together in a way that would be best described as dumb. And so what we're now doing is building that next level of primitive into these ways that these clouds communicate. Um, we have some partners where we've really, we think, uh, changed the envelope for that. And you know, Jay can talk a little bit about how we've worked with Vodafone as, as an example where we can make the cloud seem seamless. And we provide a set of primitives where, from a user perspective, other than enabling that functionality, the two clouds don't even seem to be separated. And that's, that's really been our direction. So this, so if I could just rephrase what you said. So smart things cloud will be interoperable to the third party clouds. Is that's that right. correct? Look, why is this so important for Samsung? I mean, why do we keep this? I mean, Samsung could actually do everything they could actually to create a closed ecosystem, right? Because as all most devices that is out there, but why is it so important for Samsung to open it up? So, I mean, Samsung could, could because of the millions of devices that we, that we ship, you know, every year. I mean, for sure, we could do a closed ecosystem. But the reality, the real life, is a little bit different. And the new gadgets and the new services that are being uh, uh, made available, you know, to, to the people every, every day, uh, they are not from Samsung. Some are, but most are not. I'm going to take the simple example of my home. Uh, happened to have a quote-unquote smart home for the past uh, 18 years now. Uh, and, uh, and I have 209 devices in my home. And the 209 devices in my home, I have five Samsung devices. So it's not bad, five Samsung devices. <laughs> but I mean, it means that I have 204 that are not. <laughs> and, uh, and so if I want the home to react the way I want it to react, so to provide services to me, that are valuable to me, I need to be sure that all those devices are going to interoperate, right. are going to talk to each other. They are going to, as Robert mentioned, whatever cloud, whatever direct connection, whatever service that I'm using, are going to talk to each other in order to provide the service that I'm expecting. Mm. So interoperability, I was talking about the two legs uh, earlier, you know, about IoT. I mean, there might be a third leg. So it's uh, three legs now. Okay. It's three legs now. Yeah, I have a lot of legs. So I mean, uh, the thing is that this third leg would be interoperability. Mm -hmm. There is no interesting service if you stay in one silo. Mm. So you cannot expect to have exciting, um, exciting services, exciting technology if you are not playing with others. That's great from the cloud, but look at the client. I mean. Yes, we, I mean, we, we want all the consumers in the world using Samsung phone. But fact is not. 
there's other Android phones and other iOS phones. So cloud being one is great, but if we don't support all the other phones, then how are you going to be able to control? So Jay, I mean, what's, what is your plan? Are we going to have the SmartThings app supporting other phones too? Yeah, I, I think you know, if, we were, if I were here four years ago, five years ago, I think the answer might have been different. So the Samsung Connect app, uh, to be renamed as a SmartThings app, is available on downloadable on the Google, um, Google Play Store, uh, our, our App Store, available for all these other Android, and also available on the, the iTunes for the iOS devices also. So, Already? Yes, it is available today. Um, so it, yes, it, it, so the ecosystem, uh, Samsung alone, versus you know, Samsung working with other ecosystem, I think the answer is obvious, right? Um, the ecosystem stand alone will perish and die you know, on its own, no matter how big it is, right? Because like Luke said, you don't, you don't only use one type of devices. You use multiple different choices, and that's to the power to the consumer, right? And then we cannot, ignore, we cannot be ignorant to that. And so, so we are, we, we, we are, we're going to make sure that our, uh, our ecosystem will partner with you know, other cloud. Obviously, as we mentioned, security with a very, very high um, constraint of, you know, we're not going to connect with anything and everything. We, we, our intention is open, but, you know, we want to make sure that, uh, that when the connectivity happens, we don't, um, we don't lessen with some, some of those uh, very, very important factors, you know, when we have built our uh, ecosystem, we want to keep that bar really high. So, so we will keep that also. That's great. So open for developers once you program against smart things on API and SDK, you will be able to run on different third-party clouds as well as being able to control the devices. Great news. Now, taking the next step, do you have a plan for, mo for monetization for developers when they develop uh, you know, uh, the programs and applications against this? I mean, developers should actually find a way to monetize from this. So what, what is our plan? Do we actually have something to support developers? Maybe, I don't know. I'm going to, to talk rapidly, you know, about what the current RT cloud uh, is and has. Uh, we have a monetization plan for the developers, both, both sides, for okay. the hardware developers that are building devices and for the software developers that are building services. So we currently have that. Um, there is a plan to, uh, to, of course, because of the merger, uh, to bring those um, capabilities into uh, the uh, smart things uh, cloud, but I believe that it will take a little bit of time uh, to, uh, to be released uh, officially. Okay, got so, it. So How about then support program? So any of the developers or partners who are thinking about looking for an opportunity to build IoT devices or applications for the unique use cases and whatnot, do we actually have a, some kind of support program for them to be able to easily join our smart things cloud? Jay, Robert, please. I can take this. Uh, Jay mentioned uh, we today are launching developer.samsung.com. Uh, as part of that, this is a, a full service experience. Um, so as developers run into challenges, they can connect with Samsung support um, personnel in that first stage when you're sort of working to bring your solution to market. As we transition then to having the solution in market. We have a works with smart things program, which is global, which works with the device makers, with partners, uh, whether that's a service solution or whether it's a device, uh, to give you a lot of the data that you'll need um, to be able to uh, ensure that customers uh, are using and able to use the service or product or device without challenge. So it's really that end-to-end -end level of support, not only the sort of initial level at the developer stage when you're developing the solution, but really uh, a set of capabilities that are also in market. Okay. There's also um, an interesting story, historical story. Actually, I think this whole uh, one cloud is benefiting us. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take you back a few years because it's a, it's a bit of a dark history, but it's still it's a fact. Mm -hmm. And I think it's worth mentioning because we're not taking that strategy. Mm -hmm. When we started out, uh, for example, you know, you, you, building like smart TVs, smart something, right? When, when, when there's smartness going, going into that, then there has to be some level of services or content, right? right? 
Then, then, then when we were not really talking to each other, we started actually asking partners to participate in that program. Um, the, the, the problem is, uh, how, many, how many refrigerators do you have in your home? One, right? How many phones do you have in your home? Seven, eight, nine, ten, right? <laughs> I, I, ha I have four phones in my pocket. <laughs> so, 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 you know, it's, it, developers really are looking for scale, right. right? However, they come to me and say, I'm so interested in giving a cool solution for home, right? Not thinking the scalability. And they, they jump in, they fail because it's not scalable to that level. What this is enabling us to do is actually putting the thinking with mobile and home in one paradigm, mm -hmm. right? So it's not a solution for a TV. It's not a solution for refrigerator, which will never get to that scale. It's actually a lifestyle, scalable lifestyle solution, which happens to have a component for home, mm -hmm. which happens to have a component for TV, and so on. So I think this one cloud approach is really enabling our partners and our developers to think that way so that it not only benefits them, it actually benefits us. Great. So you talk about partners. So in this new strategy of smart things, who are the most important partners? Who, who are we looking for? So I mean, when we send out invitations to everybody on this, uh, on this floor here, they can actually, by the way, you guys could uh, sign up on today as uh, uh, the developer.samsung.com as a work with a smart thing program. So who are you looking for as a partner, Jay? Oh, man. Uh, that, that's the toughest question I got so far today. So um, I mean, I, I cannot rank like who the most important customer of, my, of mine, because I think it's all of you, right? So, so you, you mentioned about our ecosystem strong with uh, lots of uh, end devices. But it's you guys who's going to grow this ecosystem to bigger and to the next level, right? I think, I think we cannot just stop with, I think we have about 3.5 million devices connected today to the SmartThings Cloud. And I mean, that's not where we are satisfied. I think people will need to have more options, more available things, so that they can create services that are more useful, that are more tangible, more meaningful to the end user, right? So I, I think it's all of the sections, all the Industry, uh, industrial sections, right? Whether it's a, we we are currently focused with the home and you know uh, and and other like a, like a vertical solutions, but it'll expand into industrial, it'll expand into healthcare industry, uh, into the automotive. I mean, we also had an acquisition with uh, you know the the Harman, which has its own industrial cloud. And so, as we are looking, I think it's all of your uh, efforts and your expertise that will bring a bigger, richer ecosystem into our, um, uh, build into our ecosystem. So. To, to general, uh, Yun, if you want to have a specific partners in mind, that you want to actually include them as part of the family hub ecosystem. Sure, so yeah. That gonna be? I, I, I think it really, we are interested in all levels of partners from, <laughs> Hardware, so really all level. Yeah, okay, like there's, there's no specific. Seriously, right? like hardware I, I give up. all the way to, you know, content and services. Um, because, because this is an untapped area. Like, uh, we want more creative minds mm -hmm. by looking, because we gave you the platform, right? You have a platform at home. Uh, another, I don't know if this is related, uh, uh, related to this session or not, but, you know, one of the, the challenges that we're having in large home appliances and uh, maybe even TV as well, mm -hmm. is that the product life cycle and the service life cycle is very different. It's actually, it, this actually stemmed from cars. I used to work in the automotive industry. Car life cycle is five to nine years in the US, right? Software and services are like sometimes six months now, right. two, two, three years. And marrying those two is not an easy uh, solution. I think the car industry is kind of getting there using the cloud now, right? So same thing with, uh, same thing with uh, you know, like appliances, TVs, anything that gets fixed into your home. There's going to be a long life cycle, right. right? So whether it be a business model reinvention, software reinvention, service reinvention, or even a hardware reinvention, we're all open to uh, collaborating. Great. Well, 
I mean, um, I wasn't thinking that we're going to talk for 45 minutes or one hour, but hour passed by. <laughs> so let me take a pause here, and then we're going to open for any questions. We touched upon many things from what the smart things means as a brand and the programs going forward, what are the technical components, what are the things that is ready, why security and privacy and interoperability is important for the smart things cloud. Does anyone have any questions for the panelists here? Yeah, please. Uh, there's a microphone in the center, and you can feel free to just come into the center. The reason why we want to take you out here is because we want to take a picture of you and remember who asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please, one by one. And if you can introduce yourself uh, to us. Hi, my name is uh, Jack Madden. I'm with Tech Target. On today, uh... Yeah, is, is that on? Can you check the microphone? Testing? Testing. Okay. Go. Okay, uh, my name is Jack Madden. I'm with Tech Target. I cover the uh, enterprise mobility space. So my question is, you've been talking all about uh, the family hub and consumers today. Given the success of Knox and those devices in the enterprise, surely the target must be smart workplaces, healthcare, offices, and then even other forms of enterprise IoT? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so historically, uh, the Arctic program uh, is meant for enterprise and for you know other domains like uh, healthcare and uh, cars and all, all that. So, for sure, by bringing together all the features you know from uh, from all the different clouds that we are talking about into one, we'll be able also to cover uh, the use cases that are coming from those enterprises and other you know uh, uh, areas. So, uh, ultimately it will be outside the home as well. So we, we do have a couple of the demos. It, the developer, uh, the kiosk, it's like the hotel chains will be a big you know, enterprise level of uh, um, kind of engagement uh, where all these uh, devices, of, you know, display devices, providing contents, uh, ability to provide an update to the software on their devices. Yes, so we do have a very keen interest in on expanding this into the B2B, if not already done so. so yep. We have hey, a, thank you. You know, one more thing that we would add there is that we feel very strongly that customers can roam into the enterprise space. So this is one of the challenges you have now is that typically your systems in the enterprise space don't understand any of your preferences from the consumer side. Um, and uh, so that is another part of what we see as solving this is that we're working, we want to work with you partners to be able to allow a person to actually roam through that. Um, some of the easy examples, obviously in hospitality, you really want this because then you can go to a hotel and ask them to play your favorite song and it'll work. Um, but we see a lot of this in the workplace um, and smart city, uh, all of these areas. Great. The, the okay. same way, so sorry, the same way <laughs> you, uh, you bring your own device, right? So uh, it would be you bring yourself. So you are the glue between all those different um, between the, all those different clouds or services or whatever. So you have to consider that by putting the user you know, in the middle, you actually you know, provide, I mean you, the user, provides the glue to all those different services. Okay, next question. Hi, my name is Nate Clark. Uh, I'm the founder of a, a new startup called Connected.io. It's connected with a K. The domain was available. It was a good one. <laughs> great, great advertising. Yeah. Okay, K, right? K Connect. Uh, my question is on the, the changes that you mentioned with the SmartThings client application. I'm a SmartThings developer, um, and my product is an integration with SmartThings. In the new Samsung Connect turn to SmartThings, what's happening to the old SmartThings app that we've been using for a couple of years? Yeah. And then the follow-up question is, as a SmartThings application developer, are there any changes in how we get the actual app user interfaces on within the app for the, for the end user? So to take two parts to that question. First question is, if I build something today, what's going to happen? Um, and we're committed to compatibility. So for, those, for that reason, all of the existing solutions will continue to work. They're working right now. It's sort of kind of proof of that, that commitment. Uh, there's a certain amount of new functionality that requires you to make some changes to take advantage of that. Uh, one of the things that we think is that um, there's actually less restrictions in some ways in the new system than the old one, so it's actually easy to get there evolutionarily. Um, but absolutely, you know, if you want to take advantage of some of the new, that will, that will take some set of changes. Uh, taking that characteristic that we had from the old system where 
in the mobile application, you had some ways to actually customize the behavior. Um, one of the things that we've thought of in, in taking our mobile application is it really is a platform. And you're going to see a set of steps that we're taking right now to really platformize the mobile application, which really allows you to do some of the things that you see in services. And we have a couple of uh, companies uh, that demonstrate this at the show as a, some of the first steps. So ADT has a solution that has some of that level of customization. But in, in general, we're opening that up. So it's not that just a company or a partner can do this. Anyone can do these things. And it's really full stack customization. Great. Next question. Yeah, Seth Page from uh, Data RPM here. Uh, question is, you've got the Samsung IoT cloud, the SmartThings cloud now. You've got your own products that are smart enabled, sensor enabled, kicking off tons of data into ever more complicated solid state and also machine state things that are becoming more complicated. You're seeing more failures out there on end devices, whether it's automotive, the world you came from, or whether it's washing machines or phablets that are, that are failing spectacularly because systems are becoming more complicated and failing, failing in ways we haven't seen before. With this platform and all the data that you're helping to collect and enable, how are you actually enabling yourselves and also your clients and partners to do predictive maintenance and analytics and actually be able to avoid of these failures before they happen so that they can incorporate it in their future designs. Otherwise, we may just come to a world where everything's falling apart and it's falling apart at once and it's affecting each other. Mm. We are, are announcing um, a set of uh, products and services um, which allow you to have management consoles and really understand you know, what level of firmware do all the people are they using? What kind of errors are they seeing really in the field? Um, was it a situation maybe their Wi-Fi strength was low and that, that led to this? So um, we've started to pioneer with a, you know, a number of ways to share data. Obviously, the customer's in control of that, um, but there are ways to incent customers to, to share this type of data. Um, are, are you making predictions in advance, or is this root cause? So it's a combination, but that's where you sit there and say, in order to make a prediction, first the customer had to decide to allow you to, to, see, some, uh, uh, to see some of that uh, data. Um, and um, you know, this is where we're trying to involve the partner, because what you're saying is like, are we doing it for the partner? No, you, we probably don't have the data to do that, but by allowing, you to, the, allowing the data to go to you, you can have some of those predictive rules. We will also do our anomaly detection, so sometimes we'll be the ones who, who phone you up and say, your system has behaved like this in the past. Uh, one of the examples that we, we have is, you know, one of the sort of favorite times for things to go poorly with voice agents is Friday at 5 p.m. Uh, and you know, we don't know whether that's because that's when there's a lot of traffic or other reasons, but we can tell you that we have a lot of predictive analytics that <laughs> kicks off um, uh, around that. The second part of our strategy, though, is also we're trying to utilize the edge uh, more. And so examples of this are, are things like when you might lose your internet connectivity. Um, because we can have something like Family Hub, which can be executing the local version of that rule, um, or a SmartThings Hub, or a router, or any of these devices. Uh, that's part of the other strategy that we've done is, you as a service provider, you're programming the rule that would make sense for that device to do, much like you do with alarm clock. Alarm clock's a pretty simple rule. It says, you know, 7 a.m., have the alarm go off. But there are other rules which would say something like, oh, you know, if the power went out and I lost internet, maybe I turn off this pipe. And so we have a set of ways to have those predicates executed in that way. And then the cloud will pick up what happened there and, and sort of piece it together. But this allows you to do some of the other half of what you were talking about, which is expect adversity and create a rule that would allow the customer to, um, to overcome that. So I also... Uh, I, need, I, need to add, sorry, I need to add something. Uh, I mean, on the, on the Arctic Cloud recently, we have actually uh, been releasing a bunch of... Uh, of um, machine learning um, uh, uh, applications. Uh, it's part of the rules engine. Uh, and basically, it's still very, very simple. But we did realize, because of the amount of data that we are getting from all those different devices, it was time to give the developers the, the, the possibility to access this data in a very simple way and already, um, I would say, pre-machine learning compatible you know, for them to create those engines that are going to be much more intelligent. Intelligent, sorry. Um, but um, what we have today, we have a simple prediction engine that is inside and an anomaly detection engine. 
So all those things will uh, be available also at one point in some uh, shape or form inside the SmartThings uh, cloud. For, the, for this unified cloud now, do you have a rough timetable when developers or partners will be able to have access to help out and build microservices on top of your cloud, for example? So in addition to, uh, to the things that are inside that we are going to provide as microservices ourselves, uh, because of the APIs that are on top of the platform, people will be able to provide also services, what I would call macro services or whatever that are going to be on, on top of the platform, and then, you know, potentially monetize that as well. I, I also have a, a quick comment on that. Um, how many of you guys are, I'm sorry for asking this, <laughs> married? You raise your hand. How many, how many of you are married for more than 10 years? How many of you are married for more than 20 years? Okay, for those, do you kind of feel odd when you see your wife's eyes? She kind of knows what you're about to do. Really, right? So, like, to answer your question, it's actually quantity and timeline. Any, any, any kind of predictive uh, intelligence or any kind of intelligence is both timeline and quantity. And many times when I deal with uh, partners, many partners say, like, show me what you have, but I don't, I don't want to show what I have because it's my proprietary. So when we, when we talk about those massive failures, predictive analytics, or any kind of intelligence living together, there has to be some level of mutual interaction with the partners sharing data, which creates both quantity and timeline. I think that's very important. Well, even though I'm married for 20 years, but I still don't know what to do with it at, the, at the right moment. Quantity, anyway, quantity. Yeah, I know, You're maybe, missing maybe quantity. Quantity is missing. <laughs> Hopefully, I can have a more predictive analytical smart things engine in my head. Anyway, uh, any other questions? OK. All well, right. let me actually give a final questions to the panelists, and then we're going to wrap it up. Well, this is 2017. 2020 is not too far. If you have a one vision, say, three years or five years down the road, whether 2020 or 2025, we're going to see a brand new technology. I mean, if you look at the smartphone the last, it's like less than 10 years. I mean, it's mind-boggling how fast things are changing. What we talk about now, maybe it's just something that is totally drastically changing in three years or five, five years down the road. Given the rapid pace of changes that we are experiencing in the industry today, what is your vision of smart things in three years, five years down the road? Not too long. Please make it very quick. So let's start from Robert. So for me, I think that devices will disappear as something that users uh, perceive independently. They will just be able to do the actions that they want to do. Devices, um, it's much like right now, people don't know the individual lights in their house. Um, it will just sort of fade into the background, and there'll be enough intelligence in the system that um, people really just start to say, this is what I'd like to do, and there will be tools to make that happen. Okay. Yeah, for me, it's, it's pretty simple. I mean, every single object that, is, that are going to be in your life are going to become assistant, not by only the, the, the capabilities of uh, what they are. So a light is a light and will stay a light, but the light is going to become an intelligent light, an assistant light, uh, if it's connected to the rest. And because it's connected to the rest and the power of the, uh, the group is going to give to the light new capabilities that you didn't even imagine you know, at the time you put the light together. I have no idea. Wow. <laughs> so so I, I think uh, the, the one of the sessions that's happening in the four doors down, the virtual reality, I think the virtual reality will be part of our reality. Um, I mean, I think there, there's a, so much of this uh, connectivity. I think the imagination is endless. I, I think we, um, it's, a, it's to our imagination. I think what we can make uh, in 2020, in five years from today, um, I, I, maybe we will be one of the things in IoT world. Okay. Yeah. I have only one desire. <laughs> One desire. I, I can guess what that is. <laughs> that, that desire is I want you guys to say, oh, it's working. That's all. <laughs> great, great. Guys, intelligence of things, what we heard this morning. Hey, smart things. A new ecosystem that Samsung is putting forward selflessly, making it open, making it as one cloud, one applications, one chip, 
but still open to all the third-party ecosystems. And all those things are available for you. I believe this is a great beginning. And I cannot wait to see three years or five years down the road. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for all the panels. Let's give them big hands. Thank you.